Welcome everyone to the IGP's soundbite for today. I'm Professor Henrietta Moore and I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Global Prosperity. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here. And it also gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Afshin Kabir Rashid, who is co-founder, director and CEO of Repowering. And since 2011, Repowering has indeed empowered communities to fund, install and manage their own clean local energy. They believe that putting people at the heart of the energy system is key for fighting the climate emergency, building resilient communities and promoting technological innovation. Afshin is also the chair of Community Energy England and a trustee on the board of Friends of the Earth. And prior to founding Repowering, she was a senior policy advisor at the Department of Energy and Climate Change. And she is a community energy specialist with more than 10 years experience of working at the, in the sector at local and national levels, including spearheading Lambeth Council's community energy program. She has a master's in geography and an MN in environment science and society, as well as an honorary doctorate from the University of Essex. And in 2016, she was awarded an MBE for her work delivering renewable energy to deprived communities in London. And in 2018, she won the Regen Clean Energy Pioneer Award. And so we are delighted to welcome you, Afshin, to talk to us. And we're so looking forward to everything you have to say. So perhaps we could get right into it. And I just offer you the floor and let you go right ahead, yeah? Lovely, thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you everyone here listening in. Um, I'm going to, I've got some slides that I'd like to share. I'm going to talk about community finance. Um, but in, oh, I'm just having a look and somehow now my slides and the practice session was working really well. <laughs> Not showing up right now. Uh, so just bear with me a minute. So I can just bring them up. Um, but I'm going to give you some context uh, around what community energy is uh what we do at repairing how it fits in and in the context of that where community finance uh comes in as well and uh, so that's the sequence and annoyingly the slides are not showing in my sharing no. window yes um, are you co-host perhaps we need to make you a co-host vicky can you see you um, there? i'm just going to do something with me a minute. Technology. It worked like a dream when we did the um, I know, that's always practice the case. run. <laughs> Don't worry, um, it'll come on stream in a second. It yes, I, I think sometimes it just takes a minute to, to recognize mm. the slides, but let me just, I'm going to try again. And if not, then um, yes, there it's showing up now. Yeah, perfect. Great. Yeah, that's great. We can see okay. that very well. Yes. So we can get going. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a bit of context about repairing. We specialize in community energy, creating local energy. Uh, and as Henrietta said, you know, we work with communities to plan, fund, and build their low carbon futures. We started our journey in 2011, in, and we established our first community-owned solar power station in Brixton uh, in March 2012. Um, so it's almost going to be 10 years of doing this. And our, our vision is about creating a cleaner, fairer energy future that empowers and benefits local communities. So we're really about that local empowerment and, and being locally rooted. And because of our history and context of being um, originated from Brixton, we're very much about ensuring that um, disadvantaged communities uh, can benefit and participate from this clean revolution that's, you know, energy revolution that's coming up and that no one is left behind. So uh, equality, social justice is very much at the heart of what we do. So we've got different strands of work uh, that we have developed over the years. Uh, one is decarbonizing buildings, which includes our rooftop solar projects <coughs> that I will talk about. Uh, we're also looking at retrofitting because that's going to be really key to tackling net zero and achieving net zero. It's about local leadership, so really empowering our communities, providing training and work experience for young people, um, tackling fuel poverty, and also the social investment, which I will be talking about uh, more so in, in the slides. 
But I, I wanted to give some context about community energy and why we at Repowering do what we do, why it's important to put people at the heart of the energy system. And we know that today when people uh, turn on their switch, you know, light switch, they get their electricity, there's a disconnection in terms of where's that electricity coming from. Um, and, um, and also the money that a lot of the energy suppliers make or, or the companies that are providing services to them doesn't stay locally, it just goes out of the local economy, it goes out of that, um, out of London, if you like, uh, and even the UK. There is a lack of trust uh, and a, a disempowerment, really, that sense that people feel. Uh, and community energy is really about tackling that. Uh, through our models, we give people a stake, a say in how um, these energy co-ops are run and how money is being spent and how it needs to stay in the local area. Um, we, I spoke about food poverty, which is absolutely key. And climate change, of course, a lot of people who join us are motivated by climate change. Uh, and there is a sense of, uh, as an individual, feeling uh, a bit daunted um, and not knowing what to do. But what community energy does is connect that individual to collective action. And by coming together as a group, there's so much that you can achieve and do, uh, which is uh, what we've, we've helped create through our community energy schemes. And we're also about disruption, energy innovation, seeing what can we do differently? How can we change the current system to be able to um, uh, tackle fuel poverty as well as uh, offer solutions for uh, climate change? So that's why we do what we do. Uh, and some of the projects that we've established, we've got uh, around uh, eight active uh, solar energy corps across London. Uh, we've got our ninth one uh, building its first project as well. Uh, and repowering really, when we started, we started off as a volunteer group ourselves. We, we were like figuring things out. Um, how do you navigate your way, do the finance, do the technical, do the, uh, uh, you know, legal due diligence, everything that's needed to get these projects off the ground. And what we've what we've set ourselves up is to enable others, other community energy groups to be able to do the same. So with that in mind, being a family of co-ops and bringing more community energy groups uh, along with us across London, we've helped establish um, 670 kilowatts of uh, solar generating capacity. That's across roughly uh, 35 buildings, uh, which includes schools, social housing, community buildings. We've raised 700,000 pounds and more uh, through community share offers, which I will talk about as well. And we've offered training opportunities for more than 123 um, young people and of course with generating renewable energy um, that results in carbon uh, emissions that are being uh, that are being displaced so 144 tons what's re really key is even though the projects are small what we can see mm. is that the impact the social impact associated with those projects are significant uh, so even uh, we, we, while we've raised 700,000 pounds of capital finance we are putting back 196,000 pounds into the local uh, community to be spent uh, for local benefit. And what is at the heart of what we do is really that community engagement, that movement building. Because before you start to raise finance in a local community, in your, in your area through community share offer, uh, you really need to build a trust uh, and uh, connections with those uh, around you. And uh, building, what we do is really listen to the communities, understand how they'd like to get involved, understand who already, what are the existing networks in that community? Because you might find that, um, you know, people don't always organize around climate. People might organize around food. They might organize around other areas of interest. It's about finding out where people are organizing and how they're connecting with each other and linking and identifying champions for your project through those existing networks. Communities often have a lot of rich resource skills uh, and knowledge to give. So there's always in community energy projects, give and take. Uh, and once you identify a group of uh, individuals and volunteers and you know that kind of bring together a heart of a community energy group, we, we look at how we can co-produce projects. So as I said, these aren't very straightforward projects to deliver. 
and they require a certain level of professional expertise. And that's where Repound comes in. And that's where we take on a more partnership working role and a mentoring role with our energy uh, groups who then become energy corps. And of course, wrapped around that is offering training, um, not just for young people, but also for adults. Because I think in my journey through deli mm -hmm. delivering community energy projects, I've learned so much uh, from you know, developing financial models to running a business to uh, doing so much more in terms of research, social impact and finance and what have you. Uh, everyone has something to give, but equally we have so much to learn uh, and it's a great way to come together and create that kind of empowered citizenship. Um, what's really key about um, community energy projects and what we do is that it is um, each of the projects are housed in energy corps, like cooperatives. That's the governance structure that really aligns well with this model of democratic principles. So you can join a corp as a one pound member, or you can join the corp by investing maybe a hundred pounds or 10,000 uh, pounds. But everyone, irrespective of how much you invest, everyone has an equal say in decision-making. Who becomes the directors of these corps? You have a say, you know, how much money should be spent in the community and what kind of activities should the community fund um, uh, support? Each member has a say. So that's really important. So that element of equality and that democratic principle is quite key uh, to making these models quite inclusive. And I know a lot of people previously thought, oh, community energy projects or community investment is only for those who have the ability to invest in such schemes. But that isn't... Uh, what we're only about. And, and as I said, that one pound membership is really key to uh, allowing people to still become part of uh, these schemes, even if they can't put in loads of money into it. And we recognize um, that not everyone will have money to invest in such schemes. Um, the circles here in this diagram represent that once we set up a port, uh, we raise finance, we invite uh, local residents to become members of the court, uh, the finance that we raise allows us to buy, for example, the solar panels and install the solar panels on a site. And once the uh, project uh, is up and running and the solar panels are generating electricity, we have a financial model built for that. Uh, so the uh, solar electricity is sold at a price, at a retail price to the building user, and that creates the income stream in the past. Uh, there was a, a feed-in tariff, which is a government subsidy, which made these projects really viable. Uh, uh, but now there's no longer a, a, a subsidy for re generating renewable electricity. So the sale of electricity is quite key. Um, and once those income streams come in, the maintenance of an asset like solar panels is very, very simple and straightforward. Um, tried and tested technology, so very low risk. Um, they, uh, you know, you, you keep aside money for operations and maintenance. And as I mentioned before, what we do is make sure that there's part funding um, income that is ring fenced to repay our investors a return on their investment. So they get 3% return on their investment. And we make sure that money is ring fenced for benefiting the community uh, so that those who can't invest and become a member can still benefit from these schemes. So that's that element of putting money back into the local uh, economy, back into that local area. So that's how uh, the model works for a lot of our projects, which are community-owned solar projects. We're also looking at how we can apply the same principles, but looking at community heat, for example, or looking at how uh, retrofit projects can also be financed through a similar mechanism. But rooftop solar is generally the most uh, tried and tested. Uh, and well-established uh, model for making this work. So community shares is the way in which we raise finance from, uh, from local people, local areas. Um, and community shares are unique to cooperatives. Uh, and I use cooperatives in the broad sense. I mean, there are, there are two types of legal forms uh, for cooperatives and one's a bona fide cooperative and one is a community benefit society, which is what's referenced there, CBS. So this is quite unique. Community shares are quite unique to um, these two uh, legal forms. Uh, community shares are not the standard stocks and shares that you have in, you know, in, in your very regulated marketplace. This is different. This is not a regulated uh, area of operation. 
Uh, community shares can be, be withdrawn. So you can, you know, you can invest a thousand pounds, but three years down the line, if your personal circumstances change, you can withdraw your money. And if the court has the finance and the cash, it can pay you that money back. The, it is non-transferable because we are not in a regulated stocks and shares market. You can't, you, you can't kind of buy shares and then sell it off to someone else and hand it over to someone else. So it needs to come back into the court. The court will, uh, you can withdraw your shares, but you can't just transfer it to someone else. There isn't a platform that allows you to do that. And as I said before, shares give you unique uh, voting rights as members. Uh, so it is, it is a very, uh, you know, it's a way of raising finance that is flexible and patient. And why we say that is most people who invest in schemes through community shares, it's con considered as a long-term uh, investment. It is not largely driven by the return, like, you know, I'm going to get my 3% or I'm going to get my 4%. Uh, is it guaranteed? The returns aren't guaranteed. But what is important is the reason why people invest in these schemes is to enable that something to happen in their local area, motivated by climate change or motivated by providing local benefit uh, for their for their community. So I just wanted to flag that. And the community shares, you know, aren't very often spoken about, but you know, there has uh, since 2012, 155 million pounds have been raised through community shares. So that's a very significant amount of money. And there's an untapped potential here in terms of uh, really um, allowing local people or people living in an area, areas of interest uh, to invest and raise finance through this uh, unique way. I have also mentioned bonds here because I think there is this uh, confusion sometimes between bonds and shares. And there are many community energy groups that have also raised finance through community shares and they've blended with bonds. But bonds are different. So the key difference is that bonds don't give you voting rights. So essentially it's a debt. You, you know, it's treated as a debt by the organization that's raising the bond. So it's a fixed term. Uh, interest payments so every year that that uh, interest is guaranteed and uh, it's for a fixed period of time uh, and so you know as I said bonds can't, bond holders don't have uh, voting rights and that's quite uh, uh, significant and I just wanted to kind of bring that difference uh, to your attention and there are other ways in which people uh, talk about more generally around crowdfunding and crowdfunding is more around donations uh, which is different. Um, so I just wanted to make this distinction between uh, the three different uh, financial instruments, which sometimes get uh, confused. And what is really unique about community shares is that real democratic principles, voting rights and empowerment. Uh, and of course, you know, building and raising finance in a community, you know, we've raised 700,000 pounds, but we've had to do our due diligence behind the scenes to make sure that you know, we've, uh, we've dotted the I's and crossed the T's. We've got a financial plan. And when you issue community share offer, you have to declare your financial plan. You have to declare the, the risks associated uh, with the projects and, and highlight um, uh, pros and cons. Um, and also highlight that the returns aren't guaranteed. But what we can do is be very transparent about what the projections are. So like any uh, business, we will, you know, we we'll, particularly since we are dealing with solar panels or buying assets, we will have our um, income projections, you'll have your uh, costs that you put, put together. And uh, for us, really, it's about promoting the carbon savings, promoting the, uh, the local benefit, how much money we are ring fencing back into the local area. Uh, and, um, you know, those are things that really people uh, want to know more about and who's behind these co-ops you know what's the context uh, you know uh, why has it been what's the purpose of the projects and that's key information alongside of course the financial information that you need to declare um, so our schemes which are rooftop solar schemes are 20 year built for 20 years um, our financial plans extend into that roughly uh, we offer three to four percent returns um, the across the uh, corps that we've established so far, pretty much most years, everyone's got 3% return on their investment. Uh, on some difficult years, uh, maybe 2%. Uh, 
So that's roughly uh, what, what we offer people. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot better than what we're getting today in our banks. Uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, there are also provisions to repay capital through the lifetime of the project. And I wanted to highlight some of our um, successes of running uh, share offers, like what does it take to run a share offer? Um, there's a lot of support out there, but essentially, you know, it's really knowing your community. If you want to raise finance from uh, your uh, local community, it's about uh, connections, uh, word of mouth, it's about your social networks um, and putting, uh, putting the information out there uh, through as many avenues as you can. And, you know, for us, our volunteer groups have been absolutely amazing in, in being the driving force in raising finance. And you can be really creative uh, with, you know, nowadays on social media <laughs> uh, in terms of what you can do. Uh, and really come up with good campaigns, maybe during Christmas time, you know, do, you can give a gift uh, and, you know, put, put uh, know your audience. So a lot of people who are investing in such schemes will be uh, most likely uh, green minded anyway. So, you know, if you find there's a local veg box scheme and put your flyers through that. So it's just really thinking out of the box uh, as well. But it's important to know that before you start raising finance to community shares, it, this is, you have to have a build up. So you need to build your network first. So it takes around four to five months to build your network and start getting people to pledge uh, their investment. Uh, so it's always to do prep beforehand. And of course, learn as you go along. So always find out where, where are people coming from? How are they knowing about you? And why are they investing? And just following on that on why, why are we investing? Uh, we uh, have uh, we've done surveys, and as I said before, uh, the large motivation has been uh, more recently has been around climate change, uh, and it's also been about uh, reducing uh, and supporting community schemes and community benefit. Um, local networks are really powerful. We found that a lot of our members hear about us through local networks, and as you can see from the map, uh, because we really use local social marketing. Uh, methods, uh, a lot of our members come from that particular local area. And I've just put in some links here as well for resources that you can look at, community shares unit, have a handbook around community shares, because I said, you know, it's not a regulated market, but um, there is a lot of uh, advice um, out there in terms of to make sure that it is done properly. And there are people who are trained uh, practitioners who can also, certain community shares can have a standard mark as well and so yeah there are a few links there and i think i'm going to stop uh spoken quite a lot wonderful ashin thank you very much it was really great actually to, to hear about that and um very impressive that all that has been done one of the things i was interested in is that um when looking at other community energy schemes that i've seen what one 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 uh, one commentator remarked that they thought they were going to run an energy scheme only to only to find that they were actually running a scheme that was about voice and participation more than it was almost about energy in other words sort of picking up on your idea that you know the creation of value that happens around these schemes is a really important element element yeah. of them and in fact drives a lot of the the motivation but i was just wondering before we let the panel in who i can see are getting quite excited and want to ask a few questions i've just wondered if um how you how you chose your original sort of sites or places to, to start was that through a process of community engagement before that or was that people just coming to you and saying we really want to have rooftop mm. top solar here it was a it's a mixture so uh -huh. people do come to us uh when we first established the Brixton energy projects that was us literally as you know uh local yeah. groups kind of finding which roofs will be good in this local yeah. area and right. should we go for community buildings or schools should we go for social housing and who 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 knows who it really hmm. matters as well yeah. do you know the yeah. uh, head teacher at a school or do you know uh, and you can directly as uh, as the group directly approach those sites mm -hmm. uh, in some instances we've been approached by the local authority for example who've been like oh we want to do the same thing and replicate that model and yeah. so then we've gone out and done some engagement to identify local champions and through that then identify sites so there's a lot of collaboration with local authorities. And I think where 
where that relationship relationship works is a lot of growth uh, uh, for community energy. Um, but yeah, and then we've had lots of uh, people directly approach us saying, oh, you know, we, I live in this building and uh, I'd love to see solar panels and we've got a TRA, like a tenant resident association who we can talk to or um, yeah, someone's come out, approached us who's part of the school. So it, it's, it's a mixture. It comes from different places. Yes, I can see that. And so do you find that the, or do you know that there's any evidence that people actually change their consumption pattern of their energy when they join the scheme, when they join the schemes? I mean, or do um, we not know whether they whether that, that works that way or not? Yeah, I, I definitely think there is a behavior change element linked to it. We haven't, we haven't uh, got sound data behind that. Maybe Charlotte can come in <laughs> on, on, on that. But it's 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 crazy how um, people do feel like they're because they're making that difference and and they're being part of such a scheme or they live underneath the solar panels they feel like it's making a difference or they're making a difference and and that they're using less electricity although they, it's not quite it's not quite true but <laughs> but there there is this feel good factor and uh, and I and I think people uh, do think about it differently so their connection and relationship with uh, their electricity and where it's coming from does change does change yeah yeah well look let, let's there are lots of questions piling up so let's let's open up to the panel and let's go first to hillary powell from bank jump pictures who wants to ask the first question and she's on the panel so she can do it in person hillary please welcome you're muted you're still muted i think just for a second unmuted yeah, that's it. hi thank you and thanks for the great presentation. We've, I'm kind of, well, not familiar with all that detail, but with Repower in London, because we've had a chat with Agamemnon Atero previously, and we're really inspired by all of your work. So I've got like probably very specific questions, but um, the um, it'd just be great to let, hear a bit more about the training and employment that you built into the projects and just like really whether yeah. that depended on whether you were working with a specific solar installer that helped on the training elements or if that yeah. you know, just the how that worked really yeah we we started it off with um a, a local resident who was part of our brixton energy scheme his name was kevin and um he was out of work at the time and when our installers were putting solar panels on on uh, elmo house at brixton we asked them like could they give him work experience you know uh, during the installation and they said yes sure and you know he got the right um, preliminary certification that he needed and there he was on site and did you know two weeks uh, with them and uh, following that he was able to secure you know further work in the construction industry so really giving people hands-on practical experience is really uh, important. And building off that, uh, again, because of our Brixton context, uh, we were challenged by uh, the local mums and they were like, well, where are our young people? Like, how are you involving them in these projects? And so then we started a, a very informal training program, which was trying to run similar sessions with the young people while we were also uh, developing the project uh, with the with the local adults, and uh, and that has a, uh, became a formal paid accredited training course that we offer for 19, 16 to nineteen year olds, uh, and it's really a it's a launch pad essentially. It gives a flavor of a range of uh, skills. Community energy projects are great because it's not just about the technical side, you know, there's the policy, there's the advocacy, there's campaigning, there's engagement, and we give them that whole range of experience uh, and know how. And because our uh, work is predominantly working in um, areas of high deprivation, we want to give young people the opportunity, yeah. which they may not have already had. Uh, so uh, really working with young people who ha don't have role models or opportunities to take um, unpaid internships. So we pay uh, the young people to attend the sessions, uh, give them a flavor of uh, the range of uh, skills or opportunities that may be open to them. And, uh, and, and then following, following that, you know, they can then choose exactly where they want to go. It might not necessarily be we want to install solar panels on a roof, but yeah. some of them have gone on to events management or further training, further education. 
Great, sounds very, very, very positive and a really important part of the work. So let's go to Enora Robin from University of Sheffield, who's also on the panel, and so can ask in person. So Enora. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you, Afshin, for the great talk. I've been following your work for a lot of time, so it's great to okay. know more about it in person. Um, yeah, it's very inspiring. I have one, I have many questions, but I've chosen just one so that other people can ask questions, which is, um, if you could give some examples of how the extra revenues generated are reinvested into community activities, I understand that it's decided by mm -hmm. local groups and cooperative members, but it would be great to know also how the projects beyond energy and new forms of ownership can create broader forms of prosperity for, for, for local mm -hmm. communities. Sure, sure. So in in terms of the revenue, when, when we build the financial model from the very start of the project, like within repowering, our ambition is to at least have like 20% of the capital uh, funding equivalent ring fence for the community. So we build that uh, um, uh, surplus income for community benefit from the very outset of the projects. Um, it has, it, this aspect has become more challenging because there is no government support for uh, uh, for renewable energy and the subsidies have been removed, but we, we're still um, making sure we have that provision because we're looking at scaling projects and delivering that scale so that you benefit from reduced capital costs. So that is, you know, how we make the income work. And as I mentioned, um, without having a feed in tariff, we're, we're being more specific about which sites work for these projects to make sure we can sell the electricity um on site we offer a lot of the schools so one of the benefits is if we put solar panels on a school we offer them a discount so then they're not you know if they're paying their main electricity supplier of edf or british gas 14 pence per kilowatt hour we're selling it to them at like 12 pence per kilowatt hour so they see a nominal saving that the, you know that benefit goes to the school for sure and in terms of uh having the community funds uh i was really proud last year where our Bricks and energy schemes have been more established, have more money um, as well in, in for the community fund. You know, they've been around for 10 years. Uh, they put money aside to support our uh, fuel poverty work, so our community support service, for us to be able to reach out to vulnerable uh, residents in the community, uh, to provide them uh, advice on either switching energy providers or accessing uh, discounts that they may be eligible for, warm home discounts or others. And they also provided funding for uh, emergency fuel vouchers so that um, the local residents could top up their uh, prepayment meters at a time of crisis when they literally didn't have the money to be able to do that. So, you know, they were in quite a, a crisis situation and this is where you know the community were able to kind of support you know a scheme a local scheme like that you know there was no eligibility criteria you know it was literally we need to help people in need and 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 that's how they did it and they also supported um some local uh, organizations who were organizing hot meals for families and so you know gave them a donation uh, to be able to provide that and that I think you know we what we really saw over last year was how these local community organizations were able to use their money for community benefit and really step in and and support uh those most in need yeah no that's really <clears throat> really good so just before we continue with the panel perhaps we should just open up to the to the virtual floor and give them a chance and then come back to the panel um so there's a question from Hemant kumar who's saying Democratic governance ensures inclusion and ownership, and he's really fascinated by the concept and the experience, but he wants to know how people in the community are empowered in terms of in information so that they can make conscious and critical choice around complex multifaceted options that exist and not fall into any sort of popular narrative or one way of thinking about things. So how does that work? How do you manage that people's engagement with all of the information around energy and, and, and all, the, all the value that's created by their engagement? Mm. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's such a big question. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a There's, huge question. Yeah. There, there is so, mm. um, so much uh, information out there and uh, mm. a lot of people who join um, our volunteer groups. So we are co-ops, for example, Lambeth Community Solar or North Kensington Community mm. Energy have quite a mixture of volunteers within it. So I think really having that diversity 
of experience and thought and, and yeah. culture is so important. Um, that brings different ideas and, and not everyone is an expert uh, in, in our groups, but they're really motivated by um, the, the aspects that I've mentioned before in terms oh. of providing local benefit as well as um, tackling climate change, improving air quality, just having a better yeah. quality of life yeah. in the outcomes. Yeah. And, you know, we're not, we're not there to sp spoon feed or, or tell people to think in a particular way, but I think that uh, engagement where groups come together and have dialogue and conversations amongst each other, they get motivated, they learn from each other uh, and are, are able to kind of figure out, okay, this is, you know, particularly in terms of energy, everything is quite complex, isn't it? So we do, we do step in in terms of uh, advice on, yeah. on, on, um, on energy or switching or energy efficiency, oh. um, you know, technologies that work or don't work. And the common, oh. the common one that we get is, oh, do solar panels work in the UK? <laughs> you know, that is the common one. Um, it, it's just, it just still blows people's minds to know that, that uh, even when the sun isn't shining, the solar panels are generating electricity. Uh -huh. um, and so there are some things which we can easily kind of uh, address. Uh, uh -huh. And there are others that, you know, the volunteer groups kind of figure out for themselves and learn and share amongst each other. And then, um, you know, the example of uh, North Kensington Community Energy is fantastic because, you know, they started off, they didn't exist four years ago. And yeah. now they're like a group of like 20 volunteers, local directors, 200 members in the co-op. Mm. Uh, and not only are they looking at, you know, new energy projects, but they're also organizing Greener Living Days. So uh, a Greener Living Day is an event in the local area, in a, in a local community center. And they're bringing people from, you know, on energy, on waste, on, you know, doctor bikes, fixing bikes to like, you know, face painting for the kids to come in mm -hmm. and linking that, uh, you know, energy to other behaviors and linking that particular community uh, to low carbon or sustainable lifestyles in the, in the most practical, uh, easy to do way. And I think that's beautiful because yeah, we're able yeah. to have those wider discussions and and uh, share information from from specialists beyond uh, themselves and and uh, us. Mm, fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's go back to the panel and then we'll come back to the virtual floor again. So now, next to the panel is Charlotte uh, Johnson, who is also an energy person. So Charlotte, can we give a few the floor, please? Thank you. Hi, Afshin. Great. Um, it's always great to hear you talk. It's always really inspiring. Um, I guess I had a question really about the university's role and how the university can work as a kind of ally to community energy groups. And one of the things I'm pushing for is, you know, UCL is building this huge campus in East London and whether the university can buy uh, local renewable energy generated mm. by community groups in Newham and whether they can enter into sort of power purchase agreement and give that financial security that those assets will get enough return. Um, but there are institutions mm and regulatory sort of issues around that so I'm gonna you know something I'm still going to push on um mm. but I was just wondering whether there were other mm. ways of support I mean also I noted your question on the behavior change studies and things like that so obviously there's the research side and I was just wondering mm -hmm. what you thought about you know relationships and strategic partnerships that the university could enter into with groups in order to support mm. this as a model mm. Yeah, you, you're right to mention that because universities, you know, we've been collaborating with universities for, for a very long time in terms of uh, placements for students like organizations like us, you know, have limited capacity and resources, you know, we're small and, and having uh, someone working on a project with us is so important. And as you highlighted, you know, the, the research side of things help organizations like us, but uh, it would be great if we were able to have these uh, virtual uh, arrangements of selling power electricity in it from um, sites in the local area that a, a business, like an organization like a university can buy. But you're right that there are, there are challenges around that. Um, but it would, you know, that would be an ideal way. But another way is, that, you know, or I would love to see universities really embrace community energy models within on their sites and host uh, community owned solar panels. Uh, you know, that, that would be fantastic, a way to organize young, young people could be leading, you know, the students of the universities could be leading those projects, gaining a lot of those skills of how, how to establish a, you know, a project themselves and, and also uh, look at 
decarbonizing the building. So I think that that would be fantastic. You know, I feel like collaboration is so key for us to getting to net zero and, and for us to kind of bring our resources in every way, be it like assets, buildings or people um, together um, to, re to really sort of, you know, um, work towards this uh, net zero ambition sooner rather than later. So yeah, I think there's loads of way in which we can collaborate and it would be great. I'd love to see that, that virtual selling <laughs> because it's difficult to find sites, you know, so many sites that don't use much electricity on the site, but, oh. you know, but there's another building further down the line that's using loads. Um, so yeah, there's great ways in which we can work, but maybe, maybe more, you know, there is a project called uh, Solar SOAS, which was on SOAS University, which is a community energy scheme. Oh. And we're great to see more of that happen. Okay, okay, great, great question. Um, <clears throat> okay, so back to the virtual floor question from uh, Jury Putri, who's saying, in your most challenging case, how do you open the community's imagination to the idea of an energy cooperative? What's the key to starting this kind of thought changing conversation? Mm. I think it often helps <laughs> for communities to see existing examples, yeah. um, you know, of where it already has happened, where it works. Mm. And um, very often a lot of communities say, well, we're different. It might have worked there, but we're different. <laughs> but there's always, <laughs> there's always uniqueness, but there's always similarity as well. And, um, <laughs> but it's, um, it, uh, yeah, just learning by seeing and, and taking them to where the projects have worked. And what we have done is um, our uh, project that was established in Homerton on the Bannister House estate. Uh, wow. You know, when we started there, <laughs> I remember uh, one of our local directors, uh, when, you know, when we first approached it, she was like, nothing happens on our estate. You know, they were always left behind and, uh, you know, we made promises and things don't happen. Wow. And then like three years down the line, you know, we, we installed the solar panels together, you know, this 100 kilowatt system on 14 blocks. Wow. Uh, you know, such pride and joy. And when, when it works, uh it, it it really brings a lot of uh community joy and pride and 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 that you know they they, they love the fact that they've had that and um and I, that's the example that i would share really and uh, we've had our, our directors from from bannister house solar leela she would uh, we'd invite her to talk to the communities where we were like building the momentum and and bringing together volunteers and so she came and spoke at uh, the North Kensington Community Energy kind of events when they were starting off. And it's so inspiring to hear from a, a local uh, leader and, uh, and uh, someone who's done it in their local area, you know, directly from them. So that sharing of learning between the different co-ops uh, is the best way um, to encourage uh, and think, think beyond out of the box and think it's possible even in your local area. <laughs> And also from the from the virtual floor, we have a, a question from Amanda Tigasari, who's saying Boris Johnson recently announced five thousand pound incentive to push heat pump installation to substitute for gas boilers in people's homes, but it was criticised for being insufficient for an efficient uh, for efficient solution. So, do you think that creating a community finance scheme would work better for that? <laughs> I think there are some things that if if it's you know, if it can be grant funded upfront, like an investment in heat pumps are quite expensive. Yeah. Um, and if it can be grant funded and someone can benefit from that, I, I think that is our, our ideal. I don't think we, we need to kind of create uh, community finance, particularly for that. The, the reason why the scheme failed was because it was in, uh, there was enough supply and there was an, oh. you know, enough people who were trained and qualified to be able to meet the demand. They had a ridiculous time scale that they were trying to work towards so there was there was you know it wasn't just the finance it was <laughs> the operational aspect of uh -huh. that project uh -huh. that uh, yeah. that led to its failure but i think the role for community within such uh, schemes is about um, finding and helping uh, uh, residents and particularly uh, vulnerable residents or those who often miss out on these opportunities to know that this is an opportunity that they can access and they can benefit and help with the handholding of uh, ensuring that that heat pump that does get installed is fit for purpose, used appropriately, and there's quality of care 
around it. And I think that's the key role for like community groups, even though there are local authority led schemes, government funded schemes, there is a role for community uh, to ensure that those who could benefit the most can participate and know about it mm-hmm. and can open their doors uh, to that technical provider. And equally, the, the community group can also make sure that <laughs> the work is done properly. The work is done properly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that they yeah. haven't put something else out of work while they're fitting in the heat <laughs> That happens. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we've got two questions from the panel now. So the first is is Daniel Edelston, and then we're on to Chris. So Daniel, please. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, sorry, I don't, I've been muted for so long. I don't know. Can you actually hear me? Yes. Yes. You're doing okay, fine. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Just wondering. Um, you know, we've been we we've set up it in many of these ways, and Agamemnon has been helping us a bit with Zoom calls. You know, in the in the height of the COVID uh, pandemic. You know, we've been picking his brain across Zoom, but uh, we, I really feel we would benefit from, you know, more of a conversation. So uh, with, with repowering, and I'm wondering how community groups like our one could uh, potentially, you know, speak to repowering, you know, how, how does one sort of go about applying to, to open that form of a dialogue, or is it just, um, you know, random Zoom calls, etc., or is there more of an app, like a sort of applied collaborative mechanism that you have. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Yeah, other other than like the IGP, it. of course, yes, okay. <laughs> 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 Obviously you can, uh, happy to have a follow up after this, uh, Daniel, if that helps. And uh, um, there, there is a forum, which is called Community Energy London. Um, and that is, uh, again, a, a group of network of community energy organizations like Repowering and others who come together and um, you know, share from share amongst each other and learn from each other. Uh, and new groups often come to the Community Energy London meetings as well uh, in, in, in terms of identifying new opportunities. I don't know if you've heard, but the, the Mayor of London has announced a new round of London Community Energy Funding, which you can access to do some feasibilities if you've got sites that you already got earmarked. And you can also, they've done a, they've um, shaped it slightly differently this time. And you've also got like some initial funding. So even pre, before you've identified your site, you've got some development funding. So happy to collaborate with you on, on that, if that helps. And uh, do, uh, yeah, do join the Community Energy London Network. Uh, lots of resources that get shared. And yeah, do feel free to follow up um, with us. I, I must uh, uh, mention here that, uh, um, Agamemnon is a uh, co-founder uh, of Repowering, been you know uh, key for its uh, starting from 2011. We worked together, uh, uh, but he's uh, he's currently CEO of Energy Garden, which is uh, another program which was incubated within Repowering for a few years, uh, and now it's doing so well that it's a, it's its own organisation. So he he leads Energy Garden, and I lead Repowering. So they're okay. two different organisations. <laughs> Just, just a quick follow up to that. I'm, I'm actually in Glasgow now, hoping to bump it. Well, hoping to meet Agamemnon in an hour or so. Are you in Glasgow uh, over the next few days, or are you, you back in, in London at the moment? <laughs> I'm in London, but we can maybe take this offline. And yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <clears throat> okay. Well, um, let's go to Chris, uh, who's got a question, and Chris is on the panel, so he can ask it himself too. I think, Chris. Uh, Thank you. Oh, you're in the room. Right, you're in the room. Sorry, with, with everybody else. Sorry. Conference room today. Um, thank you ever so much, Afshin, for the wonderful presentation, which we really enjoyed. And in many ways, uh, my question was sort of following some of the previous questions about what's the future for community energy. So you mentioned the end of feed in tariffs. Um, the community energy sectors become kind of more legally complex, more complex in terms of the contracts that are necessary. Mm. So where does the sector go? And, and sort of part of that is, is, is there still scope for scaling up in the way that, you know, might be useful given the challenges we face? So, I'm really glad you asked that. <laughs> because uh, yes, you know, the, with the feed-in tariff and the removal of the feed-in tariff, there was a sense of like doom and gloom. Oh my God, community energy is not gonna exist anymore. And that isn't right. We are really resilient. We've been around for 10 years. 
and we've we've survived the whole chopping and changing and the reductions of the feed-in tariffs. So this was something we saw coming. Mm. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like you know, we've been more specific about the sites, being very selective about them, making sure that they're sites that have on-site high demand, on-site usage. So when the solar panels are generating. Uh, most of the electricity can be used. Um, so leisure facilities are great, community buildings that have office spaces or functioning coming centers are, are really good for, for it. So it still does work. Of course, the, it's more challenging, uh, but to address the challenging, what we're looking at, uh, particularly at repairing, we, we've actually post uh, feed in feed in tariff removal, we, we, we've set ourselves a goal, like we want to establish five megawatts of uh, of solar panels over the next five years, and uh, we we want that scale. We want to meet the climate emergency, and, and we we don't want to be held back. So we are we're looking at um, a scale to make sure that you benefit from reduced uh, financial uh, capital costs. You you gain from economies of scale to operate the system more efficiently, uh, and uh, still able to ring fence community fund. Uh, we are also looking at uh, ways in which we can access low cost, flexible finance from friendly philanthropists, foundations or corporates uh, to help us give the finance upfront so we can install at scale really quickly and rapidly, de-risk the projects and then a community shares can buy off the assets once they're installed and de-risked. So this is our ambition and plan moving forward. Uh, and. Uh, I, I think, you know, obviously the energy system is, is changing, there's huge opportunities. So there's, as I was saying around retrofit, there's going to be a lot more schemes coming forward. And I think there's a role for community energy groups to collaborate with their local authority partners to see that, uh, you know, uh, those who need such schemes uh, the most and can benefit can uh, participate. And uh, we're also working on projects like um, on community heat because that's, again, another area of growth and development uh, uh, as a solution for net zero, but again, a role for community organizations. Uh, and I can mention uh, we're working on a program called Green Skies, which is with Islington Council, London South Bank University, and a, a, and a consortium of uh, uh, partners looking at what, what can that look like? And repairing's role, we're, we're investigating, how can we replicate this community finance for community heat projects? Uh, what would that look like? What would the governance look like? Uh, you know, and how would that interaction work? Um, so there, there are opportunities around uh, new technologies, new business opportunities uh, that we can work. So I think with the removal of the feed-in tariff, there's been organizations like ours and repairing is more focused on uh, more creating a, a local energy service model. So we're looking at integrating uh, the different aspects of energy services, not just focusing on our community rooftop, but really looking at fuel poverty, heat, retrofit, uh, and how that all integrates. And my vision is really about that. It's about um, having a local energy service provider, uh, you know, in each local authority, and you've got a community energy group at the heart of that, running that uh, service offering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Could I come in with a quick follow on, which is actually yeah. my colleague Ala's question? Yeah. What are the, in terms of that vision, what are the other challenges beyond, you know, the end of feed in tariffs? Um, the challenges are finding collaboration partners. So I think um, the, where, where I mentioned local authorities work closely with community organizations. Uh, where that partnership is effective, it really works well. And we've got very good relationship uh, with Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. You know, we're developing a relationship with City of London. We're based in, in Lambeth Council. But with local authorities, I think there is this element of, again, lack of maybe limited resources, budget constraints, and as a result, they may, might not prioritise uh, community energy uh, schemes. And, and there, you know, just recently, earlier this year, for example, government was uh, plowing in quite a lot of money uh, through public sector decarbonisation funds. So obviously they want to prioritise those opportunities and um, if they've got limited capacity. And I think those kind of, it, the, the challenges around finding the collaborations and the collaborative partners who have um, the time and willingness 
um, to invest in us. But I think it's quite a missed opportunity <laughs> if those dialogues and partnerships aren't established because you know, there's so much we can do together. Um, and, and the policy landscape is challenging. You know, I mean, you've had schemes being announced and then ending ridiculous timescales um, for delivering them. It just doesn't help, you know, and no stop start kind of um, schemes help anybody. It doesn't help the market, doesn't help investing in people, offering the training um, opportunities that you can provide. So I, I think we're, we, we're all in the same boat. We're all facing the similar, similar challenges. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's definitely a, a really um, a, a sort of w an important kind of evolution that can take place at, from from the immediate engagement with energy into other kinds of things, which you've been hinting at, Ashin. So I think particularly retrofitting for housing, I think particularly, you know, if you have members of the community who are skilled up in installing solar panels and maintaining them and so on, then of course you can move easily into people who've got the skills to retro, to, to acquire the, the additional skills for retrofitting and the management of that energy consumption and so on. And I think that one of the things that might be very interesting from a sort of uh, local point of view is how these things develop over time in other words mm. if energy gives the energetics that make, brings a larger change that comes behind it you know which i think is quite fascinating have you have you seen anything like that beginning to emerge yet <clears throat> well, i think so yeah in you know while i a lot of our community energy groups and, and repairing is built we, we've uh, our success and our uh, projects are largely what people see is the rooftop solar projects Yes. So that, that is one part of it, that's the building block and the other aspects that we're working on around fuel poverty, tackling fuel poverty, and we're scaling up our community support service, you know, we're influencing um, uh, policy on that front to our innovation projects where we've got our, um, you know, uh, supply trials where we're looking yeah. at how we can sell electricity that's generated locally. So there's so, uh, you know, those, those aspects of our work are definitely possible because we've got the foundation we've got all of that kind of uh, uh, track record already built uh, but now we're looking at how we integrate all of those services and so you know we are uh, working with uh, with um, Charlotte through UCL on on you know one of our local electricity supply trials with uh, with EDF on one project called community uh, where where there is also UK power networks who've uh, supported the installation of a battery uh, to maximize on-site usage so that benefits can be passed on to local residents um, and we've also got another local electricity supply scheme um, being trialed with octopus energy and uh, energy local so we're really testing and developing new uh, models yeah. Uh, yeah. and learning so we're really looking at that integration Right. Well, I think it would be really fascinating. And I see we're about to run out of time. We always run out of time when we're having fun. But anyway, but it would be fascinating to continue with you and with Charlotte and all the other people on the panel about, you know, this idea of, you know, what what is the change that makes the next change? And that's mm. the, that's the that's the, really one of the things that, that the IGP is very interested in. Mm. So I'm afraid everyone, we don't have any more time for questions, um, but just to thank the panelists, um, please can you put on your camera, all you panelists, um, but mostly to thank Afshin for a fantastic uh, talk and answering all those questions. And so thank you so much. And I hope we will see you again in the IGP, but we, the panel can give you a round of applause, even though it's virtual. So well, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks very much. Have a good okay. day, everyone. Thank Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Yeah, bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>